Yokohama, your tire. The FIA WTCC is delivered by DHL. Where performance matters, you'll find Total Quartz. The 2014 FIA World Touring Car Championship is about to get underway on the streets of the capital of Morocco, Marrakesh. We are ready for the season to begin. A welcome to a hot and humid Marrakesh. 31 degrees of air temperature, track 35 inside the cars. It'll be closer to sauna temperatures, 60 degrees plus. For the two races here on this fast, very bumpy and very demanding circuit. Mehdi Banani, the local hero in a front-running car, will be the big focus of attention for most of the locals. But, of course, one of the biggest stories in motorsports over the winter has been the arrival of Citroen, the multiple World Rally Championship winning team, and driver Sebastian Loeb in the World Touring Car Championship. Hello, everybody. I'm Martin Haven. Sitting alongside me, I'm thrilled again to have the services of multiple British Touring Car Champion Matt Neal. And, Matt, whenever anybody comes in, to rattle the establishment, especially with the change of rules that they seem best prepared for, you're going to see all the rules that we previously thought changing, and, and that was what makes this such a fascinating race. That's right, Martin. I mean, it's Citroen have done their homework, and they've come in, and they really hit the ground running, and because it the regulations, they're not an evolution of what we've been seeing before, the S2000 regulations. It's a complete new clean sheet of paper. And that means dramatic changes and, and the, the cars have been designed from the ground up, much like the new Formula One cars and engine scenario. So Citroen have, have really done their homework. They've been working on this for 12 months in advance. So a lot of the other teams are already playing catch up with them. So we're going to see that Citroen dominance here. We've seen them see them dominating in qualifying, but the inter-house battle and fight they've got three very hard charges very fast customers you know which so Loeb is, is actually on the back foot because of his, his racing experience rather than rallying so it's going to be really exciting to see the Citroen in-house battle unfold and, and everyone else scrapping behind them and snapping at the Citroen's heels as well. Well, what a place to bring a brand new car. Most of the cars, other than the Citroëns, almost untested in any shape or form. And they come here to a demanding street circuit. Jose Maria Lopez is a man who starts on pole position. The only one of the Citroën drivers who's not a multiple world champion. Nine times rally world champion Sebastian Loeb on the outside front row. Tom Chilton starts third in a Roal Motorsport Chevrolet ahead of Ivan Muller, who cut a chicane on his fast lap. Dusan Borkovic, a rookie, starts in fifth. He says, he is rather nervous and Rennie Munich will start sixth place on the grid great qualifying for him ahead of the Sol Castrol Honda of Thiago Montero Norbert Mikulic in a Honda Mehdi Benani in a Honda next up and then Tom, Cru uh, Tom Coronel for many years a BMW driver in a Chevy Cruze he's alongside James Thompson on the grid and Thompson's uh, teammate Rob Huff and Mikhail Kovslowski make up the row behind him with the three factory larders well, at the tail of the field, a couple of changes. Gianni Morbidelli clashed with Gabriele Tarquini. Big accident for the Italian's car, or both Italian's cars in free practice. Tarquini will take no part in the race weekend. A, an uncompleted shell is being rushed to Paul Ricard today to be built up for next week. And we will also not have Peter Fulin making his World, Cup, uh, World Championship debut in a Seat. His car was damaged in qualifying. His engine has been given to John Philippi, his Campos racing teammate, in the TC2 spec Seats run by Campos. Campos racing uh, cars also in TC1. And the difference between the two, TC2 is essentially last year's 1.6 litre turbos, around 300 horsepower. TC2, like these cars, much bigger, fatter arches, much bigger aero, 380 horsepower or so. Now, this is what happened in free practice. Tarquini out breaking himself, Morbidelli getting it wrong in the chicane. And you see from the onboard, Matt Neal, what an impact that was. It bananaed the Honda. Yeah, it looked quite innocuous from, uh, from externally, but... Um yeah, it's a big hit. It has Bernard had written the Honda shell off and um, they've had an awful lot of work to do to get the crews up and running. Yokohama, your tire.
Ici Kenwood. Love driving. Advan. Yokohama, your tire. The new Renault Clio. Restart your heart. Simply delivered for you. At speeds of more than 330 kilometers per hour, they take boldness to the edge of madness. Welcome to the adrenaline-stoked, bar-banging action of Superbike. The Superbike World Championship from Aragon, tonight at 1900 on Eurosport. the heart of the Superbike World Championship with Elf. Where performance matters, you'll find Total Quartz. And here is the Soul Castrol Honda. This weekend, Gabriele Tarquin is shell destroyed. The internals of that car, have, I mean, in fact, the entire car is already left to go to Paul Ricard where we race next weekend so that the, the shell can be stripped and it all put into a new shell, which was heart assembled as the spare car anyway. FIA President Jean Tot down there among the well wishers on the grid. And what has really triggered all the changes for this season a wholesale has been the change to the 1.6 litre turbo engine we had 1.6 litre turbo engines last year what has happened this year is the air restrictor for the turbocharger has been enlarged more air means you can burn more fuel burning more fuel means you produce more power they got from 33 to 36 mil three millimeters doesn't sound like much if I said to your road car, you're going from 300 to 380 horsepower, then that sounds like a lot more. Of course, Matt Neal, more power means it's going to be going faster, so you need more grip. More grip means you need more aero. It means you need wider tyres. It means you need bigger wheels because you've got to fit bigger brakes in to slow the thing down. And the wastegate set at 2.5 bar means that nobody can produce more power than they're allowed from the turbocharger. Now, of course, the turbo spinning at countless hundreds of thousands of RPM is the single hottest component. Exhaust gases from the cylinders go straight through it, and so the cooling is absolutely essential. The intercooler uh, for the charge that goes through from the fresh air into the engine is vital, and, of course, the lubricating and the cooling of the bearings in the turbochargers has always been the Achilles heel of any turbocharged engine. That's right, Martin. The new regs, uh, as last year, they're restricted to one engine per year. But I think it's five turbos they're, they're allowed to use because obviously the, the turbo is a the engines are unique to each manufacturer. The turbo is is a, a championship regulation one which they all have to use. And the temperatures they're running at are in excess of a thousand degrees. And, and the manifold, which is the primary exhaust feeding off the engine, when they're on the dyno, they actually become translucent. So you can see through them. The heat in them is that excessive. And so obviously they're they're. They're making those out of all exotic materials and trying to insulate them as well. But keeping that heat in obviously does age them very quickly. Yeah. And the experts tell us that under braking, the metal of the exhaust manifold stretches because it's so hot and, and, and then stretches back or, or contracts again as the car accelerates, the weight of the turbo moving backwards and forwards. Now, here's a big story, uh, big in both ways. Two metres eight, this chap is, which by my reckoning, at one metre 97 being six foot six, means he is at least six foot ten. Matt Neal and I, if you know Matt from British Touring Cars, you'll know he's no shorthouse. 
Dusan Borkovic stands a head taller than us, and he is starting his first ever World Touring Car race, fifth on the grid. I talked to him a little bit earlier. He said, I am very nervous. I, it's, it's like starting a spaceship trying to get one of these things, all the buttons you have to press and the settings you have to have right. So I'm very nervous. Well, a man who'll be less nervous will be the world champion, four-time world champion now, Ivan Muller, in this brand new Citroen C Elise. Realistically, he probably should have started on pole position. He was up on his qualifying lap until he misjudged the last chicane, trying to pinch an extra hundredth here or there. But he will start on row two of the grid in fourth place. But what might be interesting, Matt, is that we've watched various cars doing practice starts as left, they've left the pit lane, and you noted that the Citroëns, who are first, third, and second, and fourth on the grid, seem to be the least efficient at getting away from the line. That's right. I mean, uh, they were all doing their practice starts, and obviously, start. People say, what is the hardest thing about driving one of these cars? And, and the lovers always say, it's getting them away from the line fast. And whether it's with their rally experience and then trying to, because we all run different engine maps for starting and, and different weather conditions. And obviously the, the start line map they've been working on, maybe it's akin from their rally background. They're trying to reduce wheel spin. That's actually not the, the fast way to do it. And I was watching the practice starts. The most impressive ones off the start at the box look the larders. They look very aggressive. But and the Citroëns look very lacklustre getting them off the line. So my bet is, if I was down a betting office, I'd love to see Chilton into turn one first. <laughs> well, it could happen. The Chevrolet is very quick, very good away from the line. Sebastian Loeb, nine-time World Rally champion, number nine on the car, front row of the grid. And let's make no mistake, this team is all about Loeb, but with Ivan Muller drafted in as the most experienced touring car driver they could find, with Jose Maria Lopez as a wild card, these three drivers, these three Citroen drivers, Matt, today know that in Macau, in the FIA Gala, one of them will be world champion. That is almost without, without question. And now, right now, from this moment, for 24 races, it's got to be gloves off. They have got to beat their teammates to be champion. And that is going to be a fascinating fight to see. Where performance matters, you'll find Total Quartz. The FIA WTCC is delivered by DHL. Four monstrously long straights housed by hairpins and, and chicane. So it's it's going to be a real toughie, very unforgiving for them. Long, fast, very bumpy. There's Gabriele Tarquini. Should be racing today. He's not. You know, he's got to put this behind him, and he has already. It wasn't his fault. It wasn't any fault of the team. It was just getting hit by Gianni Morbidelli. Well, let's get down to the car that's third on the grid and hear from Tom Chilton. Welcome back at the WDC in 2013 with more exciting fresh cars. Uh, they're bigger, more downforce, and we're about six seconds faster. Um, Marrakesh, maybe not ideal because it's like a street circuit. Uh, if you make a mistake here, you get punished big time, like what I had in the free practice. We're now in the green flag lap, so we're going to the grid. Um, first, high speed chicane, third gear, long straight, up to the corner number five, which all the way, you go down to second gear. Then a long left-hander, you just saw, until the corner up here for the long straight back to the first chicane in second gear, then a long straight back to the high speed chicane, that's the chicane where I uh, <coughs> softly touch the barrier, let's say it like this, all corners, but that's another problem, my car is fixed, and that's in third or fourth gear, and then up to the last corner, which is down to first gear. I mean, um, yes, slip streaming is working, first time with these type of cars, Let's see how these cars race, but one thing is for sure, it's very challenging for me and also the others. Um, I have to prepare for the race. Bye-bye. Keep watching. Tom Coronel, not Tom Chilton. Teammates at Roal Motorsport, you saw the Roal team bosses, Roberto Ravaglia and Aldo Prio in the garage. And there is Tom. Field being led round by our pole man, Jose Maria Lopez. He leads the championship as well. Five points from sitting on pole ahead of Sebastian Loeb. Tom's Chilton. 
Grabola and Dusan Borkovic. And there is the man, Yves Maton, who is the head of this programme. Cars coming to the grid for the first time in a long while, not led by the safety car, not pacing themselves for a rolling start. There is James Thompson's engineer in the Larder garage. This year, another of the big raft of changes is that all races will be from a standing start. So, for Citroen, for their drivers, for the Chevrolet drivers, for the Lada drivers, for the Honda drivers, for everybody, the season is just about to get underway. I think 2014 is going to be a fascinating campaign. Multiple World Rally champions come racing. How will Citroen do? They have been fast in practice, fast in qualifying. They dominated qualifying with the front row of the grid. Can they convert that into victory on the streets of Marrakesh? Jose Maria Lopez and Sebastian Loeb. The revs rise, the red lights are on. The season is underway and a very slow start indeed for the black car. Number 77 of Rene Munich, he gets away slowly, but this front row got away very nicely. And Citroen, one, two, three, Ivan Muller, Matt Neal, is going to try and challenge for the lead as early as he humanly can. But there will only be one rule, don't hit a Citroen. Oh, is that Munich off Munich, again? Yeah, nearly took off teammate Gianni Morbidelli, and Munich has gone from seventh on the grid to last. The Citroen's made a, an average start, not brilliant, but I think Chilton didn't and characteristically for Tom, he's normally very fast out the blocks and he just, he didn't manage to get the power down well enough, otherwise I think he could have at least hold, hold Muller off, but uh, here comes Monterey, he's already on the charge in the Honda. He's got by Dusan Dorkovic, Dusan Borkovic, I beg your pardon. Uh, so Norbert Mikulis, Mehdi Benardi behind in their Hondas, and Hugo Vallant made a good start in his Chevrolet. He's in front of Tom Coronel in 10th, who skates wide, Lada Trio right behind. Very good start from the back by Gianni Morbidelli, the ex-Grand Prix driver trying to atone for his mistake the other day. And he has latched onto the tail of those three red Ladas. And look at Hugo Vallant, you see what I mean about brawn GP colours, day glow, yellow and white. Citroen, one, two, three. They're dropping Chilton on this first lap. Yeah, the Citroens have got the hammer down, but I don't think there's any team orders in-house, as long as they've obviously not got to hit each other. That's the, that's the key point. But round here, if they push each other hard enough, this circuit is incredibly unforgiving. It's narrow. It's surrounded the whole way around by unforgiving concrete walls. You know, we've got four fiercely long straights just edged out by tiny little bumpy chicanes and hairpins so it's anything can happen oh someone up the inside of Belmont then yeah so the Citroens come towards us Lopez Loeb and Muller then Chilton then Thiago Montero Dusan Borkovic drive through penalty by the way for the 77 car of Rene Munich he's in the pit lane now, I would assume that his clutch was slipping in some way and he couldn't stop himself jumping the start because he certainly didn't make anything like a good start and just dropped right to the back of the field. He's gone through and out again. So maybe it was, as uh, Dusan Borkovic said, un lack of familiarity with the controls necessary to get this car started and off the line. Yellow flags in the final sector. Munich would have just been coming in for his drive-through penalty yeah. for, uh, for jumping the start. Now, these Citroens are in flying formation. I mean, Lopez is definitely pacing himself at the moment, but these new new regulation cars, they are more reliant, a lot more reliant on aerodynamic. Now, you can see him ducking out to try and get some cool air in it. The ambience has gone down from yesterday, which is better for their engine cooling and their brakes as well. But if these two, Loeb and Muller, following Lopez, they've got to be careful because they're going to start using their tyres up very, very quickly, and then that'll hand it back to Lopez. Montero and Borkovic having a great scrap for fifth place. Fourth place in front of them and starting to pull away a little bit more again now is the black car of Tom Chilton. And then behind, you've got Norbert Mikulic. There's the local hero, Mehdi Benani's in the red, white and green of Marrakesh, of Morocco rather. And he's got Hugo Vallant behind him. Montero and Borkovic. And Borkovic now clearly got over his nerves. The red, white and blue colours of Serbia on his car. He started third on the grid. Oh, yeah, Rennie Munich moved, then stopped. Then got wow. mugged by the two Hondas. Yeah, that's a little harsh because, boy, he certainly didn't gain anything from that, did he? Here's Tom Coronel's view. He makes contact with Munich, who's stopped. 
Little bump from his left rear to Rene's front right, but he got by. And Jose Maria Lopez leading into the first corner, as he does now. Yikes, Johnny Morbidelli, that's where he got it all wrong and T-boned Gabriele Tarquini in free practice. This time, he didn't hit anybody. Well, they've all been incredibly well behaved so far, haven't they? So, um, a few little straight lines through the chicane. Well, it must be, there's a lot of pressure on Montero's shoulders today because, you know, Honda are the... Ah, there you go. Uh, that's what bumper. the yellow flags are for, a little bit of damage. Who oh, gave along, he gave it the out before, of... he, uh, before yeah. he took it himself as well, so... Yeah. Yeah, the, the Honda are the reigning champions for manufacturers' champions, so, you know, they've got an incredible task in front of them with Citroen coming in this year, so... But with, with Montero out on his own, without Tarquini as his wingman today, it's, he's, gonna, he's on for a tough couple of races. Yeah, he is. And look at Borkovic. He's really pushing hard. Montero on the narrow inside line mat, and that makes it easier to defend, but harder to get the car quickly through the chicane because you're offline and you're making it tighter for yourself effectively. Yeah, all he's going to do is slow himself down, give Chilton some air and some clean air just to, to pace himself behind the, the three Citroens. And, you know, open himself up more for attack on book from Borkovic. Well, the fastest lap of the race, no surprise for race leader Jose Maria Lopez, 144.731, 144.748, and 144.835 last time round for Loeb and Muller. Now they're down in the 44 ones, so they've gone six tenths quicker on this lap. They are really starting to stretch their legs now. And Matt, you know, we've seen in the last few Grand Prix how Mercedes have got the dominant car and how the teammates are really making a race of it. We are absolutely going to see that from, from the Citroen trio. Not one of them is going to roll over for the others. That much has been clear right from the beginning of qualifying. It, exactly the same as when we had the pace car at uh, the last Formula 1 Grand Prix and the two Mercs were out front. Suddenly they just put the hammer down and they were gone. And they, they're in another league. And these guys, they've just suddenly, that last lap, they put the hammer down. They're a second lap quicker than Chilton. In, in the Chevy on that lap, so um, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be, Muller's not going to be happy in third, I know that. Damage to Rene Munich has brought him back into the pit lane for a third time. Tom Chilton all on his own in the black Chevrolet in fourth place. Mum and Dad here watching, Thiago Montero in fifth, the best of the Hondas with Privateer Busan Dorkovic. Busan Borkovic, I beg your pardon, from Serbia. And that's going to be such a spoonerism all season long. And the Serb is really, really giving Thiago a tough time. Now, if Thiago starts slowing the, that pair down even more, what it's going to do is, is hopefully for Thiago, is bring the other two Hondas into the play. Well, that's what you would have thought by oh, now. Got, Might have happened. Going looks up the insides there's a little bit of contact and Thiago runs wide now the stewards will look at that and see whether or not they feel that was an unfair move but interesting the tiniest touch making all the bodywork fall off though well, he was trying to get down the inside Thiago closed the door Matt is a draw oh now Montero has he got a puncher Smoking it's, heavily at the it's rear. an arguable case because you could say that Montero is just going for the apex but then the Chevy side of the coin will be Montero's tried to close the door when, when Borkovic has already got his foot in it. So it's a good arguable point. You know, you'd have a good argument from either side of the fence on that yeah. one. And I Bork mean, the good thing is no one ended in the wall. Yeah, both continuing. And, and, and Borkovic, of course, was on the dirtier side of the track, so it was less likely to be able to slow as efficiently as Montero. I mean, the other argument is it's clear to see that the, the, the Honda was, yeah. was holding the Chevy up. So... Um, yeah, well, that's his, that's his, you know, that's his, it's the job of the faster car to get by safely, not the job of the slower car to let him go. But Thiago is struggling now because he has got both Hondas behind him, Norbert Michelis and Mexi Benani. And if Benani gets a pass in here, you wait until the crowd go mental in the grandstands. We'll hear it above the noise of the engine. Sebastian Loeb in second place, Ivar Muller in third, but still the fastest man on track is Jose Maria Lopez leading in the Citroen. Now three quarters of a second clear which is nothing if you make a mistake in a chicane. Yeah, three Hondas flying in formation. But it's sort of breaking down into teams at the moment. We've got the three Citroëns, then the best of the Chevys, then the three Hondas, or the two best Chevys, then the three Hondas, and then James Thompson, 10th, Rob Huff, 12th, Mikhail Kozlowski, 13th. 
in the three larders. In amongst them, they've got Tom Coronel in his Chevrolet. You can hear the wastegate chattering on somebody's engine as they build up speed out of the chicane here. On board with Morocco's hero, Mehdi Banani. Citroens have dropped to a nice steady gap between them to give themselves a little bit of air, but every lap that Loeb follows Lopez, he's going to be loaning. He's soaking up valuable, you know, he's not done a race in anger yet, and every lap, I mean, he's a class act, that's, there's no argument there. But it, it's just his inexperience of circuit racing, but every lap he's going to be soaking up more and more information from the other two and he'll, he'll be a tougher act to beat from Ooh, every race on. Big lock up there from Sebastian Loeb. He's trying to close the gap to Lopez. He obviously feels he's let the engine cool down enough and himself cool down enough, and now he's attacking hard. The gap was 0.85 before the beginning of this lap. I think it was less than that getting into the chicane. Looks like it's less than half a second, maybe not even four tenths. Loeb having a big push here. Now, he's not got the racecraft experience that, say, Ivan Muller has. And there's Rob Huff's car. Looks like temperature problems. You're always going to see those blowers on because the extraordinary underbonnet temperatures. Turbo's running at 12, 1300 degrees Celsius. Uh, but it's a bit of a drama for Rob Huff. Debris on track. Now, looking here, it seems that Loeb's car is coming to him. Yeah. When Lopez's car is going away, but Muller's is going away. But they'll all share data, they'll all you know, work together, but th there will be an inter-team battle, not just between the drivers, but the engineers all want to be top dog in the team. You know, they're all, yeah, look at that, low fastest lap of the race so far. Closed by two tenths, or a little less than two tenths. Johnny Morbidelli all over the back of Mikhail Kovslowski. Teammate Renny Munich is behind. Incidentally, there will be a black and white flag shown to car number seven, Hugo Vallant, for the collision at the hairpin here. But no decision yet on the collision between Borkovic and Montero, who were fifth and sixth and are now fifth and sixth, but in the reverse order. And Morbidelli's got by Kopsilowski. Johnny Morbidelli really blotted his copybooks seriously. Look at the heat and the smoke coming off the brakes. We're expecting this. The Chevrolet drivers were, as a man, saying we are really struggling on on brakes, the feel in the brake pedal, not there even in the early laps of a session. Yeah, the aero and the weight advantage of these new modern cars means they can brake incredibly late in them, but they've all been, you know, it's not as bad today because the ambient's gone down, but we had 36 degree ambient yesterday, and so the on-track temperature was, was absolutely excessive, and they were all frying the brakes in no time at all. It should be easier to you know, we had darker clouds earlier, even threatening a bit of rain, but the blue sky's peeking back through, and it's actually starting to creep up in temperature again now. On board with Tom Coronel. In front of us is James Thompson. This is the battle for 10th place. Don't forget, Tommy starts race two from pole position. If he's got a car left, he just hit the tyre stack on the inside of Matt Neal. Unlike your road car, basically all you can see out of here is the top of the dashboard and then the road in front. You're so low in a racing car, you can't see those corners. And for a lot of the drivers who haven't, like the Citroen team, spent six months testing, judging the width of those extra fat wheel arches is difficult. Yeah, and I mean, a circuit like Marrakesh, it's incredibly unforgiving. We had a, we had a, a shot from above at one of those chicanes earlier on. It was absolutely fantastic because from the outside, it looks like the drivers are going in, maybe just drifting a little bit. When we see from inside, you can see how hard they're working at the steering wheel, catching the oversteer on the way in, playing with it, working at it, wrestling with the car, trying to get it through to the second apex and just keeping it out the wall on the exit. Well, top speed of these new cars isn't a great deal different from the old outgoing ones. They've got around another 40 or 50 horsepower, but there's much more drag. They're much wider, so bigger frontal area, bigger wing, bigger splitter, much more efficient front aero and rear aero. And all of that gives you grip, but grip at the expense of drag, inevitably. And it's uh, because there's no real corners here, the top speed isn't that much different. What we're really going to see with these cars is their mid-corner speeds are going to be sensational compared to what the older, narrow-tired, less grippy cars could produce. So here the lap time is quicker, but when we get to other circuits with corners that we've been to, I think they will extend even further inside the old lap records. That's right, Martin. I mean, 
we, you get to the likes of Spa, where we're doing the full circuit, which is a fantastic, and uh, uh, Paul Ricard, which is the next one next weekend. And you know, we're going to see these cars coming through. And Marrakesh is very much a point and squirt, where with the Citroen engine, it, it's you know, it's a derivative of the, the, the all-conquering rally engine. They will have focused on a lot of torque. I mean, it's been changed and updated and modified a lot for racing, but it will have a lot of torque, which will help them here for their. Yeah, for their speed out the corners. Apart from anything else, they've got more power than they ever had in the rally engine. So that, you know, all that is adapting as well. So everything's built by Citroen, apart from the tires, everything. So in-house, all their electronics, their engine management, their gearbox, their transmission systems, everything is in-house. So they have absolute quality control. And, you know, they've really come in with a Formula One attitude down to mopping the floor when the cars are out of the garage to keep it clean and, uh, I was, and nice looking. I was told they ten, spent 10 million euros on development of the electronic side of the engine. Electronic side, not Tom mechanical. Coronel's in, more damage. Look, the front splitter, the entire front splitter looks like it's come loose because it's separated on the right where he hit it and on the left. So he's out of 11th place. Meanwhile, our Honda battle, Montero, Mikulic, Benani. Now, a lot of these guys, they're going to be going into uncharted territory. You know, a lot of them haven't, haven't been able to do enough testing. They've been going for outright speed. At Morbidelli's two, in as well. Two Chevy's in trouble. Right. We heard that there were going to be brake problems. I wonder if both have come in with brake problems. Uh, Chilton seems to be lapping pretty strongly still. He's still in yeah. the low 45s, which is... And Hugo Valence there in the white and Deglo yellow car is also a Chevrolet, and he is in the hot, turbulent lack of cooling air behind this little queue of Hondas, and he is surviving. There might be other issues with no morning warm-up, Matt. This is the first time since he T-boned the Honda of Tarquini that Morbidelli's been able to run the car, and you can look at it in the garage and put it all back together in the garage but it's not always exactly how it should be it might still be a legacy of that for him losing a morning warm-up uh, martin i have to interrupt these these this is getting good now and we've got five laps left to go and, and this citron battle is closing up i mean they're all you can see them all looking for fresh air and that's partly for their engine partly for the brakes but uh it is closing up there's there's a stone's throw there's just over a second covering a blanket to all three of them so um I would hope that it's going to uh, it's going to spice it up a bit in the in the closing laps. Well, we just saw Franz Engstler. This is his teammate Pasquale Di Sabatino. Di, Di Sabatino, their first and second in the TC2 class, with John Filippi in third. Broken brake duct for Gianni Morbidelli. Reports Ben Constantiuris from the pit lane, and I imagine with the splitter so loose or the whole front aero package so loose on Coronel's car he was running into a cooling issue as well and being on pole for race two I'm sure the Roal guys a broken gear lever for Tom Coronel wow in that case the Roal guys have definitely got to work hard because they've got to fix it and get it out or get it fixed before Park Ferme rules apply before the race uh, between the races Stewards will investigate the clash between Montero and Borkovic after the race or apply a penalty after race. Lopez, Loeb, Muller, top three, covered by six tenths of a second last lap. Oh. Less than that now, Matt. That's looked like the last lap of them on, and they're forming up for a formation it photo. Does, doesn't it just? Yep. Okay, so here we go. This is the Daytona 500, isn't it? 450 miles, just making sure in contention for the last 50. This is 16 laps. 13 of which are making sure you're in contention for the last three. But Martin, this is Lopez slowing it up. Yeah. They've either got an issue which they're following a party line back at the pits, but at the moment, the fastest car on the circuit by a country mile is Chilton. Yeah. So you, we could see him. At the moment, he's a few seconds down the road from these three, but we could see him. Are these three playing the party line, or are they going to have a go? That's the question. I would have suggested, even for a company as controlling as Citroen, that having them hold station from lap one of the first race of the season might be a little bit Here's over the Chilton's top. Chilton's coming into picture That's now. That's Morbidelli. Oh, is it? He's just come out of the pits again. Oh, I'm disappointed so Ch about Chilton that. is six seconds behind them. These three are now four seconds slower than they were at the beginning of the race. Yeah. Early world, even mid-distance of yeah. the race. They've no, suddenly absolutely. fallen off the edge of a cliff. Yeah. And I wonder if that is brakes or tyres. They've been using the new tyre. It's an 18-inch wheel. It's now an inch taller, and it's 10 inches wide, not 9 inches wide. But they've tested this car exclusively on the new tyre, not never on the old tyre. 
they went through 800 tyres in testing. You only get through 180 in a season per car. I'll tell you what, Martin, Chilton is just over five seconds down the road, yeah. and he's almost two seconds a lap quicker than these guys at the minute with four laps to go. Well, one thing is certain is you can put three Sigeons side by side across the road and stop a Chevy winner. I don't, I don't know, it could be good to watch. Though, it would be it? very good to watch. That would be a great ending to the race. Meanwhile, here is our battle for seventh. Thiago Montero is just up the road. The black and red car, that's Norbert Mikulic in seventh. Mehdi Banani in eighth. And with the Dayglow roof, that is Hugo Valant in ninth. Very impressed with his ability to adapt himself to this new car. Really inexperienced driver, Valant, in terms of this world championship. And uh, has done a, a standout job all weekend. So too, though, is Jose Maria Lopez. One race weekend only in Argentina in a BMW. And here he is, put the car on pole. He's led every inch of the way. He's resisted two superstar multi-world champion teammates. And he's still in front. Well, there is Chilton, the second of the black cars. So he is closing very fast indeed on the Citroëns. Lap 12 of 14, two to go after this. We're only a third of the way into the lap. And Tom Chilton, as he gets down to corners four and five, is still closing fast on the Citroëns in front. They're lapping very high, one minute 46, is low 147s. Renny Munich comes back into the pits yet again in his Munich Motorsport Chevy. His teammate is the first black car with the white flashes. Car number 10, ignore him. Johnny Morbidelli's a couple of laps back. But Tom Chilton, Matt Neal closing in at two seconds a lap. He'll know that because the team will be telling him. But what can he do? Is he going to get to them even? Yeah, we need more Bedelli to help Chilton and give him a toe up some of the straights rather than hinder him. If he, he, Chilton doesn't need any hindrance at all. I, I can only think these three are, are, are following a party line. Muller would be attacking. Muller doesn't not attack. He's a street fighter. And it's give him a sniff and be going so slow they've got to be if they are then they get a resounding boo off me <laughs> at round one well french teams have a history of trying to control finishes in all sorts of racing peugeot not yet but uh, uh citron rather not yet but peugeot absolutely have and it very often backfires if they're starting that now and making muller stay third You'll be able to tell from Muller's body language when he gets out of the car. I don't, I don't think, yeah, they'll, they, they, they'll be no, yeah, yeah, it was as fast as I could go. The guys did a great job. No, he'll just stalk off. I mean, you know, the controlling is to such an extent that... The, right, Justine, look at that, right, look at, and I've just... Oh, go ahead. to the times. Lopez has just smacked, they've all just smacked. Yeah. Yeah, they've yeah. gone two seconds quicker now. Right. Same time as Chilton, just... They've seen Chilton now. closing and they've opened up again. Yeah. Let's so that, not be silly, let's go quicker. That confirms that... Yeah. that so it's in team formation. Whoever's correct. first into the first corner yeah. wins the race. But, I mean, their, their controlling aspect is such that even wives and girlfriends are not allowed in the garage to watch the TV monitors during qualifying or the race. They are banned from the garage. Because it's obviously such a busy place and there's so much going on that they'd be in the way of. Yeah, maybe the, 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 the Citroen top bra should go to Formula One to Ooh. chill out a bit. Yeah, Formula One is less anal. Norbert Mikulic makes a mistake under pressure and Mehdi Banani is going through. They've got a few Moroccan fans watching that with delight and Mikulic is slowing right down. Through has gone Hugo Valant. Mikulic is in trouble. Matt, he went straight through the chicane, and that suggests to me that he's got a brake problem. Susceptible to brake problems. They were struggling with brakes on that car in free practice when they were trying a few longer runs. And Valant is no longer tucked right up behind Mehdi Benani. He's on the opposite side of the track, trying to get cooling air through his air dam. This is a chance for Citroen to post the result they were hoping for, a one, two, three. They didn't get it in qualifying, probably should have, but not all plans go according to the rule book. Rob Huff looking to get back into the car. No, he's not. Is he just putting the steering wheel on? Huff is out. Coronel is out. Munich is out. Our front row pole starter for row two, Tom Coronel. With that gear lever problem, that could be a major issue, a real disappointment for Roal Motorsport. Yeah, the Chevys have been, because it's such a last-minute thing, they've been, RML have been building six cars. You know, the spares is an issue of what they're all carrying. And I wouldn't have thought a gear lever would be a real sort of prime one that they're going to bring as spare you know the small bumper splitters and more consumables which are going to get eaten by concrete walls and other cars so um 
Well, I hope again, they have got a spare one somewhere. Again, bearing in mind the big crash that Tom had earlier in the weekend in free practice, maybe there's a legacy from that as well that's finally some a casting has cracked. Last lap, we're on the back straight. It is going to be a Citroen 1, 2, 3 unless one of these highly qualified drivers makes a very rookie error. Jose Maria Lopez won his second ever World Touring Car Race and he is going to win his third ever World Touring Car Race, which will give him a hit race uh, far greater than any multiple champion so far. Into the final chicane, he's escaped that one. Just the hairpin remains. Sebastian Loeb was half a second behind and is showing no signs of making a pass into the hairpin. And Ivar Muller even less. Muller must be stewing livid if they've been told to hold station after the first lap. It's going to be a Citroen 1, 2, 3. Lopez wins. Loeb in second. Muller in third, but there was no battle between the teammates. And was that team orders? Fourth, Tom Chilton. Great result for him. Fifth place, Dusan Borkovic. A fantastic start to his top class world touring car career. Smiles all round at Citroen. They have done what they have spent a year planning to do. They have had the rules changed to their satisfaction, built a car to the new rules that nobody else had the time to do, and they have come out with a thoroughly well-tested car. So well-tested, in fact, that they even spent a day at a racetrack with two cars deliberately hitting each other in racing situations to find out what was going to break. That's the level of preparation that has allowed them to sweep the board. You just saw our TC2 winner, Franz Engsler, leads teammate Pasquale Di Sabatino by 20 seconds. John Filippi will finish third. And whatever else the ramifications of the 1-2-3 formation finish, by getting pole position and by holding off his teammates at the start and controlling the race from the front, as Engsler wins TC2, winning outright, Jose Maria Lopez has shown that he is not just that other guy in the team. He is now going to be our championship leader after the first of 24 races. Well, I, uh, I'm interested to see that all three body languages as they get out of the cars. I'm, 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 I'm more interested than Lopez winning because we were struggling to get a smile out of him after qualifying on pole yesterday. <laughs> so someone had trod on his cat. He's, but he's pretty relaxed, isn't he? Well, now, I want to see Muller when he gets out of the car. This is what would have happened if Chilton had caught them at the <laughs> yeah. end of the race, isn't yeah, it? I think you're probably right, actually. Yeah. Maybe the Citroen top brass that told him he wasn't allowed to smile. I don't know. They seem to be smiling quite happily. Yeah, oh, they look, do. They they've do even now. got a French flag, but they'll be drawing the covers down to hide everything that goes on in the garage. Keeping our cameras out through free practice. Now they appear to have realised that actually being on telly isn't such a bad thing after all. Maybe Tom has put a Citroen shirt on now. <laughs> well, our, our pits cameraman went to Yves Maton and the, the head of the engineering set up there and said, what can I film, what can't I film? Cleared everything. And was then immediately in first free practice thrown out of the pit lane by their PR lady. So public relations, going well with that then. Not quite as well as the cars are going. Indeed. I think the drivers are going to be doing an awfully good job for Citroen, no matter what the, uh, the front of house staff do, because this is a very relaxed paddock. It is a very friendly championship. It's going to be very hard to maintain this facade of rigid discipline. So the Argentine flag and the French flag together being taken down to the Parc Vermeil area to greet the top three cars, all Citroën's C Elise. A one, two, three result. Jose Maria Lopez is our race winner. And with the two Alsatian multiple world champions, as I said at the beginning, 13 world championships between them, nine for Sebastian Loeb, four for Ivan Muller, Jose Maria Lopez, who last raced in Europe in Formula Renault V6, comes back to Europe in an entirely different category and produces a stellar result. Yeah, for those people who, I mean, Jose has got an incredible pedigree. You know, some people might not have heard of him, but he's, he's a Formula Renault, Formula One test driver. He's GP2, 
Renault World Series, yep. Formula 3000, multiple TC2000, Argentinian champion, so. Sebastian Loeb changing settings there on the steering wheel, well, possibly on... so nobody else could see them. <laughs> I wonder whether that was Lopez's car he was leading into. Oh, yeah, yeah. turning up the heater controls and winding <laughs> off the brake balance. I think that was his own car. I think we had the camera on board in his car, didn't we? Oh, we got some smiles as well. Yeah, yeah. And rightly so. And I, I think we've enormously increased our audience in Argentina as well, because this man is a proper superstar. Motorsport, second only to football as a crowd favorite on Argentine TV. He's a multiple Argentine touring car champion. And that is step one to perhaps becoming a world touring car oh, champion. Well, it looks happy. Not. Well, he's looking relaxed. Ooh, no, you know, okay. he's happy for Lopez. Uh, I tell you what, th this is unfolding. This is going to unfold like a good book this year because Muller doesn't take well to being beaten by teammates. And that's great. That's great for us to see as a fight. And Lowe will be soaking up the info and will be a great competitor. Absolutely right. So Jose Maria Lopez is our race winner, the Argentine dominant for Citroen. race one here world touring car championship in marrakesh you must be very happy congratulations yeah i don't believe it <laughs> um, you know in, in this uh, occasions first things it comes in mind you know to thank to thanks all the team and my teammates uh, everybody who made uh, this possible for me um, four five months ago i i never i never imagined this so i'm really happy really happy uh once i uh, wanted to dedicate to all my family, all the people who support me, all the people from Argentina, and my girlfriend, uh, all the team has been very kind with me, my teammates, Seb and, and Ivan. So it's thanks to them, to a great car, uh, you know, to win here in the street circuit, which is not easy. Uh, it, was, uh, it was quite special. <laughs> there was no big battle between the three of you. Why? Uh, I think, it, you know, we, we were a bit afraid from the brakes. We had some big problems yesterday, so... We push as hard as, as we can, but uh, always uh, been aware that the, the, the brakes, you know, were a big issue. So uh, I think we battled a little bit, but uh, in the end, uh, we, we 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 took our we took uh, the, the cars to the end with a very good uh, uh, points, with a, a podium finish for the other teams. So uh, I want to congratulate all Citroen that uh, also, you know, uh, a year ago they were in rally, never involved in in, in the tracks. So now they 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 are here and they are really working well. Congratulations, well done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And uh, yes, indeed, congratulations to Jose Maria Lopez. And she came in with the big question, Matt, why was there no racing? And they held up the, the they played the brakes card. They've been testing relentlessly for six months and they still can't get their brakes to slow the car down. Then I think they've got more than that to worry about. confirmation there of our race result jose maria lopez the race winner his teammates uh, just easing off towards the end tom chilton closed to 6.6 .6 seconds behind but you would think that maybe if they've been watching formula one they might realize that there is good pr mileage in letting your teammates race each other look at what reaction there was to mercedes allowing free reign to nico rosberg and to Lewis Hamilton to race each other and pass each other endlessly. It just proved so exciting. If we're going to get formation flying for every race, then they're going to shoot themselves down because people are going to turn off in their droves. I can see if they've got a technical issue with the brakes. And brakes have, have been an issue here, not just for Citroen, but for every mark, every new car, TC1 spec car. So if they have got an issue, they don't want three cars in the wall. And I can see them, you know, if they've got an issue with brakes after six months of testing, they've got... I can't imagine that being the case. I, f I find that really hard to credit. Nobody else has done any testing on their cars because they were racing different cars last year. I, I think that's a very handy excuse that has been handed to them by everybody else. However, we'll However. wait and see for race two. <laughs> Spoiler alert, it may be that the Citroens are quite quick in that as well. Well, the one positive thing in race two is we're going to see them starting back in eighth, ninth and tenth places. So we're going to see how they can race. Indeed. And see how they can manage traffic. So we hope for, hopefully Coronel can, they can, uh, the Rao guys can get Coronel back on the road because um, we want definitely want him to take up his pole position. 
Well, there's been a slight delay to the uh, repair time. It will now start at five o'clock local time, which is the same as British summer time. So we're an hour ahead of GMT, an hour behind CET here. Well, Sitchin have had the dream start, haven't they? Very quick in qualifying. There's the one-two result in the uh, Independence Trophy. Franz Sengsler on the right, Pasquale Di Sabatino on the left. So place here for Ivan Muller. Sebastian Loeb in second place. Le champion des champions, the winner, Lopez Jose Maria. And Jose Maria Lopez from Argentina is our race winner. One of 24 races is down. And Citroen, one, two, three. And they will also receive the trophy for the winning team. Franz Engsler comes out to take the Yokohama trophy win. And so we will have our trophies presented. And then before that, the national anthem of our winning driver. And for our winning constructor, the national anthem of France. It's a very fine idea from the Citroen team down below to sing it, since the uh, circuit organisers seem to have lost the anthem. Super, madame, messieurs, we will pass to the remise of the trophy. I think they had to abandon that one because Jose Maria didn't know the words. <laughs> well, I'm not quite sure how they managed not to find the French tape here, but uh, Citroen will clearly be bringing their own to future races. Yeah, it's not as though they don't speak French in Marrakesh. Yeah, no, absolutely. So Ivan Muller adds yet another Marrakesh trophy oh, yeah. to his collection. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Louis Marrakesh. Your well, friend Justine will be, uh, is here with their daughter. I wonder which garage Monsieur she was watching it from. She wasn't to be in the Citroen one. When the Roal Motorsport team is where wives and girlfriends of the Citroen team were uh, welcomed. Sebastian Loeb, second place for him. First World Touring Car trophy, first World Touring Car race, first World Touring Car podium. And Jose Maria Lopez. Well, Matt Neal, it was a fairy tale story last year in Argentina when in a Vika Sport BMW. He took victory in race two after showing such pace in race one. But now he's in a genuine front-running car and he has beaten his two teammates in qualifying and in the race. He's got to feel comfortable now as he holds up this massive trophy presented by FIA President Jean -Tour. Martin, I'm just laughing how, how he's going to try and get that on his hand carry baggage to get back on the plane. Yeah. That's going to have to go in the truck to Paul Ricard. Strikers trophy. Well, the Circuit announced saying so many technical changes for this year. And of course, Citroen had more of a running start of it than the, their rivals. But everybody has had to adapt. More powerful engines, more aero, bigger brakes, bigger wheels, bigger tires. All sorts of strains. The whole transmission will have had to be re engineered for the extra power. And thanks to her with one of last year's cars, the Kumali BMW driver. 
Again, putting in a very strong race to win the Yokohama Trophy. Oh, I mean, that's a bit of a hefty old beast, that trophy. He doesn't want to drop it on his toe, does he? Uh, they want to make Lopez's forearms pump up, so he's, he's a bit tired for race two. <laughs> this is all part of it, right? No, you've got to hold the, the trophy up. No, strategy. no, it's a killer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all, it's all the tricks of, the, of decades of racing. So there you go, the first race of a new season. New rules, new imponderables, and lots of question marks still remain. One thing that is certain is that Citroen have got a very potent team on their hands. Engstler, Di Sabatino, Filippi, the top three in the Yokohama Trophy. And disappointment for Peter Fulin, who did not get a chance to race here. Franz Engstler, incidentally, next weekend will be racing World Touring Cars and two European Touring Car Cup races in Paul Ricard. So he's going to be a busy, busy driver.